Yeah. Hello and welcome to the Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. It's time to get fired up. Make sure you find the Raptor Show wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe. And please rate and review the program. I'm your host, William Lou, joined once again by the Worm Rider. All Worm Rider, <laughs> Samson Folk. Yeah, I yeah. watched. I watched Dune last night, so and I'm a Dune fan, so that's the reason for that. I, I did ask you, yeah, like, what's the name for like what's like a hoop head version of uh, we, word for Dune? We looked at the Reddit, and that's what came up. Worm Rider, yeah. <laughs> All right, we're not going to waste any precious time because uh, we do have quite a few things in the rundown today, uh, including some pretty major news with a new WNBA bid uh, to revive the hopes of the Raptors or Toronto in particular bringing in a new WMA franchise uh, for 2025. And so joining us on the program is Shireen Ahmed, CBC Sports. Uh, I'm just going to read your profile here, uh, Shireen, because, you know, people already know you on the pod, but we never introduce you properly. So in addition to breaking the story, uh, Shireen Ahmed is a multi-platform sports journalist, a TEDx speaker, mentor, uh, and an award-winning sports activist who focuses on the intersections of racism and misogyny in sports. She is an industry expert on Muslim women in sports, and her academic research and contributions have been widely published. She is a co-creator and co-host of the Burn It All Down Feminist Sports podcast team. So, Shereen, I I feel like I never gave you a proper intro, but I think all it takes is for you to break one of the biggest stories in sports, in Toronto at least, uh, for you to get those titles officially said. Shereen, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, and I would like a longer introduction next time. Will and Samson, please. Longer, because that's not mortifying enough as it is. Okay. <laughs> that's only half of what it says on your CBC profile. But I was on the CBC profile because I was trying to find your piece, which broke yesterday in the uh, evening, and it was, you know, a lot, a lot of talk um, just in my circles. A Toronto sports mogul, Larry Tannenbaum, pursuing WNBA expansion team. It's up on CBC Sports. You can read it there by... Shireen. Um, so yeah, as you detailed here, Larry is leading a bid to bring the WNBA team to Toronto through his own group, the Kilmer group. Uh, what can you tell us about the situation and, uh, you know, the, the group that is bidding for the second chance, basically, at WNBA coming to Toronto? Well, I came on your show in May um, to talk about the W game in Toronto and how great it was and everything like that. And there was a resounding sense in Toronto that we were ready. And I, like many people, were like, okay, this is probably, I might have been a little overconfident that Toronto would get an expansion team. That's not what happened. It went to Golden State. They were the 13th. Portland was the 14th. But as we know, Portland dropped out. So within Toronto in circles, whether it was sport management or media or fan or community or players, there was a a sense of disappointment and frustration, particularly Mm -hmm. when the details of what happened came out. And everyone's like, what the hell? Because like this is a perfect place. That game in May sold out the lower bowl in less than 20 minutes. Um, and it just, it, it, it was a sense of a real sense of frustration. Like, are we going to do this again? Is it really going to be an illustrated model of patriarchy that's preventing ad- advancing women's sports, which is essentially one of my sources said that said that exact thing mm. that there's all, there's this lingering sense of patriarchy and that men will always be the top tier of athletics and i mean sorry caitlin clark just proved us completely wrong on that like not me because i don't believe that but you know what i mean so anyways moving forward larry tannenbaum went with like kill uh kilmer van nordstrom which the kilmer group which is his private fund and now there's a sports division that was reported today um that ivan giridzik who is sorry gazidis who was the CEO of Arsenal FC Mm -hmm. and AC Milan is going to head up the sports division. And more interestingly enough, I had heard that Teresa Resch was leaving the Raptors. And I was thinking to myself, wouldn't it be really cool if she let up a W team here? And then that was a joke. And then literally a week later, I got a, I got a phone call Mm. and said, you're going to want to know this. And I'm like, yes, I am. And then I spent a couple of days digging and sourcing nobody wanted to go on record to say anything so Mm. that's what i had to do yeah i wanted i wanted to ask because you wrote back in january kind of how you know the media landscape journalism sports media whatever is is falling apart to some degree like it's not as well funded it's not as well represented and you had written about how 
you know, as women's sports kind of gets on the uptick, on the upswing, how are we going to see that represented in media? How do you feel Toronto is set up to kind of like cover a prospective WNBA team here? And that's a really fantastic question. And at the same time as media is really shrinking in so many ways, and we really desperately need good journalism, I'm still grieving the vice shutting down completely. They shut down their sports sector, um, their, their, their section years ago. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the first places I published because anything that's sort of not legacy media is sort of like it feels like it won't have a it won't actually have a life here. And that's really frustrating. I'm very lucky to be, I consider myself very lucky to have a job at all doing what I like. You know, and we get a lot of stories from CP now. There's a lot of wire sports as opposed to live reporting of things from CBC Sports because we were just hit with massive cut, cuts and funding. Now, in Toronto in particular, I don't have to tell you guys this, you've got Lindsay on the show all the time, right? Like, I mean, Lindsay's someone who has been around this space for a long time and has a beat. Chelsea Late is also one of those people. Savannah Hamilton, you've got Kayla Gray on the sidelines. Like, we're very well built within the basketball and I'm I'm not suggesting that they have to leave that beat and come to the W mm-hmm. but there are a lot of people I'm also an instructor well you forgot to mention that in my oh I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, so um, I also teach sports journalism and sport media at TMU uh-huh. and we have budding stars like the universe could explode with the talent from those students who are ready who are hustling who have side gigs to be able to report and report really well. And I'm not talking only women, I'm talking students. Mm -hmm. You have guys, you have girls, you have, you know, gender fluid or non-binary, whatever. People just love the women's game. People love the W and that's where we are. And I really hope that in addition to the teams that people start thinking about that and if there's any ethical billionaires out there, which I know is an oxymoron (laughs) that can invest in independent media like maybe you all can get one of those ethical billionaires and have someone specifically for women on your show because you are the most highly regarded basketball show in this country we all know this so if that can happen and without any of this competition like i'm gonna say this because i'm salty and i can do this here amongst family there's a lot of people who tsl still hasn't reported the story Mm -hmm. and i don't know if that's because i broke it or whatnot, but like there's that too. There's that sense of competition that I really don't think should happen at this juncture. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like it really shouldn't. Sports Illustrated did it, Sportsnet did it. I have a lot of people, a lot of colleagues texting me, congratulating me on the scoop. News isn't my day to day. So this Mm -hmm. was so exhausting. I'm so tired, you have no idea. And like, I wanna crawl back into my columnist happy place, but like, this is important and there's so much around the structure of media that's needs uplifting right now in every sense so i really really hope that happens and with these new leagues proposed leagues we've seen with the pwhl we've Mm -hmm. seen not only opportunities for reporting but i want those people to be remunerated like the athletes have been saying the people covering those sports should also be remunerated. Labor is labor. And in this economy, like what? Can any of us get a condo anywhere in the city anymore? No. So like we have to think about that and Mm. to sustain it. Sustainability across the board, not just for the sport, for everything in the ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is, this is part of the reason why people are so, so excited. Um, you know, at first when the WNBA came here to play the game and it was instantly sold out and we were all there, it was an incredible atmosphere. We talked about it on this program, um, not only excited about the prospect of adding another franchise to Toronto, which pretty much has most franchises now, honestly, right? Um, but at the same time, we saw that there was a market for this and there were going to be opportunities for people to, you know, either be employed in this or honestly, even be inspired and play in the games too. So I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, we're really excited for, for this news to come through. I just want to ask you a couple more details. I know you, you're running short on time. You have, um, as, as I listed above here, uh, 16 jobs. Um, so details wise, they will be playing at Coca-Cola Coliseum. 
And you also put in the note there that there's there's talks of potentially building a practice facility that could be used for both the Canadian men's and women's national teams uh, to train uh, there as well. What what more can you tell us on, on those two items? Well, I got a hold of Canada Basketball and they were very tight lipped because, again, the story wasn't supposed to break and it definitely wasn't supposed to come from me. So <laughs> that's part of the fun. But yeah, um, there's going to have to be a lot of permit allowance and also even if they play at coca-cola there needs to be systems of humidity control and cooling in order to ensure that the arena can go back to being the hockey arena that it mm -hmm. needs to be for the marlies there's issues of dressing rooms and the infrastructure for those mainstays of the dressing rooms so there's a lot happening and also um you know uh, coca-cola is being looked at possibly by other leagues mm. That I haven't confirmed, but like there's rumors within other leagues that other people want to, you know, might want to play there. Mm -hmm. Because one of the problems my sources told, told me in Canada and in Toronto in particular, there's a shortage of mid-level venues. Okay. So you've either got really small places or you've got massive places. What we really need is the infrastructure to help with that growth. Like you can't go from zero to a thousand all the time. There needs to be those steps for growth. So in addition to this, the league is uh, proposing to start or the new team would start 2026 season, which also happens to be the men's world cup in this city. Mm. So there's a lot of questions and things that need to be fully answered. They would have to get you know, permission, essentially an agreement from the city of Toronto and from FIFA to have, um, have those games there. And if not, one of the other brilliant things is that one of my sources told me that it would be pegged as Canada's team. So mm. if there would be ex if there would be games possibly across the country, they might do that. Mm -hmm. And Ted and Bob has the money for that. So there's ways to go around those hurdles. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about it, it's a pretty well laid out plan. There is room for expansion in this country, but we're we're not 100% sure yet on where it will be, but most likely, yes, Coca-Cola Coliseum. But there's just things that have to be, you know, finalized. Yeah, and, and I think it's really exciting, but also could be a potential challenge too, because it does seem like a tight timeline regardless. You know, not to, not yeah, to, not I... to plug prehistoric Alex's book, but uh, <laughs> it does give me a little bit of those vibes as to everyone scrambling and, and making this whole thing come together in time. You, you know what, though, Will? I don't know. Look at what the PWHL did. We you're right. We can't do anything, bro. What are you talking about? You're, you're like, right. Look at, we can do it for like, tw no, I'm not going to say we can do it for 2025, but like, I <laughs> yeah. think time will go by fast. Okay. Well, we'll look forward to it. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. This is, this is such a great development for basketball in Canada and, you know, just wishing the project the best of support. But uh, Shireen, I appreciate you. You are very busy and I, I understand you've been very busy chasing the story. So I hope you get some downtime uh, after this is all done. But enjoy your time in the spotlight regardless. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. Yeah, Samson, what, what, do, you, what do you make of the story? Because that was obviously the biggest news that happened yesterday. There was also yeah. some other items. Kelly got extended. Raptors made some, like, uh, and a roster sort of decisions. We'll get to all that, of course, as the Raptors show. Um, but this is a huge story. We're, yeah. we're, we're getting a WNBA team. I, I covered the game when it was here as part of media. I thought that it was done extremely well. I thought the response from the city to it was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, what, what Shireen kind of echoed at the start of the show is like, why isn't this happening? Why are there, why is it like, it seemed like the momentum and a momentum isn't always the same in fandom or like people wanting things as it is behind the scenes, but mm -hmm. there seemed to be momentum for that to happen. And all the markers for like, it's a big enough market. Yep. There seems to be infrastructure. There seems to be money here. Why isn't it happening? And then to see that, like, people were disappointed, and now it comes back around to a place that can definitely support that team. Absolutely. And that has, you know, the fervor for the team. Mm -hmm. And especially kind of like, you know, it's what Kelly talked about a little bit, but, you know, the growth of women's basketball in Canada is burgeoning. You know, Canada has been at the forefront of it, has a lot of great players. To see this kind of stuff, the, the ripple effects are wide-ranging. Mm -hmm. We talked about it yesterday, like, how my small town I grew up in yeah. saw a radical change post-championship. And just to have, like, for young women in Canada to see themselves represented, like, within the country mm -hmm. professionally, I think is massive. Absolutely. I think that's that's the coolest part about this. I mean, I, I know that 
and we've had this conversation with Shereen a million times, and it, it always kind of bothers me a little bit when it's like, yeah, but is it financially very viable? Does it make money? And of course, you have to invest a lot of money into making something like this happen. So for example, expansion fee for the WNBA is $50 million. That's what the the the, the Warriors group uh, paid to bring one to San Francisco for, uh, you know, a couple years down the line. And, you know, that's, you would imagine the same fee that would take for Toronto to enter into this market. Uh, as, as Shereen detailed, there's all sorts of things. You got to, you know, outfit the arena, maybe build a practice facility. Uh, again, these things all come with costs. But I think more than anything else, number one, you see like women's sports is absolutely exploding, right? In terms of like, you know, if I don't know why I'm saying this for investors, but if you if you were one of these virtualistic <laughs> billionaires and you're looking to invest in sure. sports in particular, the men's market is like as saturated as it gets. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, it, it's it's been invested in, it's been built up, and you know, uh, largely speaking, you can maybe see some valuation changing in teams and things like that. But a, it's a really competitive thing, and it's 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 already something that everyone has jumped into at this point. You missed a boat for the most part. Uh, the Phoenix Suns went for $4 billion. Okay, you missed a boat. Um, but at the same time, for women's sports, you're seeing this uh, level of investment start to pour in, and you're seeing the success and the growth. The, the changes in growth is much more exponential than it is in men's sports. And so I think from a business perspective, especially in a place like Toronto, where you know every it's, it's such a huge city in terms of just commercial um, you know, opportunities. Like I, I have no doubt that there will be enough sponsors to sort of like fill this sort of idea. And then more importantly, there will be enough fans because that's the mm-hmm. thing that you see overwhelmingly was the disappointment that like, why do we go through all this and, and really pass through everything fans could possibly do to show up and try to support and, and, and they sold out all the merchandise. Honestly, I, I don't even remember walking through Scotiabank after that game, but it looked like it was like raided. There was yeah. no items on the shelves. Like exactly. they literally bought all the merchandise possible. So yeah, I mean, I think there's gonna be a fan base. There's gonna be support. Um, and yeah, I think long term wise, I think it's it's been great. We have hoops to watch in the summertime yeah. now. I think there's also a societal ethic. Not to be get too much into no, this, let's do but it. like there's a societal ethic that you know it's subsidized by the NBA. It's important to subsidize things because human interest kind of like it amasses in one place Mm -hmm. and creates like this mass of wealth, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not healthy for anybody, not really. You use that amass of wealth to kind of like support other things. And this isn't just about the WNBA, but it can be exhibited here. It's like the WNBA has a chance to pursue profitability. But on the societal level, I don't even like the approach necessarily of like, well, if they don't make X amount of money, then women shouldn't have a league. It's mm-hmm. like, I don't know if profit motive is like the most congruent thing for a healthy society. It's like women play basketball. Mm-hmm. Women should have a professional league. There should be, you know, a level that you should be able to aspire to, to play that level. And men's basketball obviously is like the most insanely profitable thing in the world. And it's I don't know, man. Lot- C- certain teams lose money <laughs> all, all, every year. We just don't talk about it. It's not like, yeah. hey, the Brooklyn Nets lost $100 million this year they're not viable or they're sure. not valid anymore. Like we don't even, we don't even think in those terms. Exactly. So why would it apply in this case? Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's just obviously it's the, yeah. you know, Shereen talked about it, like right. the underpinnings of misogyny yeah. really allow us to focus in on certain aspects of it and kind of pick apart certain aspects of it. Yeah. And we wouldn't apply that kind of litigious thinking to other things, which we haven't been. You're right. Um, so yeah, I, I guess this is really exciting. This also solves the, the question of why did Teresa leave the Raptors? Yeah. So there's a huge opportunity here, and, and I'm curious to see uh, what her involvement is going to be on that front. Um, on the Raptors side, so there was also quite a bit of Raptors PR press releases. I know yeah. Josh <laughs> and Justine, and they were they were busy clack clacking yesterday like six. on their keyboards. Yeah, a lot of press releases from them, so I appreciate it. Most importantly, the Raptors have reached the extension with Kelly Olenek on a two-year, $26 million contract extension, so that will carry him for 2025. And 2026, he will be 34 in 2026 when the deal is up. Um, obviously, Blake Murphy, who is not here on the program, but it is in the, he's in the Toronto. He's in. She's just chilling, and he did get the contract details for us: 12.8 million for Kelly next year, 13.4 the year after. What do you make of Kelly getting this two-year extension? I think it's a good thing. Just as a quick thing, Blake also tweeted that me being on the show woke him out of his uh, his vacation. He was like, I can't stand it. I have to break out of this. But um, uh-huh. as far as Kelly getting that money, I think a lot of people kind of obsess over like getting like the best contract for a team. Right. And, and the people being like, there's a slight overpay here. And yeah. I'm like, 
I don't, that, that I don't know, man. Maybe. It doesn't, it doesn't mean, matter so much to me because, like, those types of margins you want to win when you're under the, like, financial restrictions. Mm-hmm. Like, the Phoenix Suns, for example, if they got a Kelly Olynyk-level player for the biennial exception, mm-hmm. life-changing for sure. that team. Yeah. But the Raptors have money. They're in a flux state. We talked about, you know, both Jakob and Kelly being players who can help facilitate good play and development. Getting them on here for two years... He talked about, you know, kind of putting down roots and getting... He wanted to play for, you know, Canada's team, the Raptors, for his whole life. Yep. And all these things meeting together, it's like, he's going to be a good vet. The Raptors have the money. And that's kind of where it's at. Mm-hmm. There's interest from both sides. It seems like a win. Yeah. And you could, you know, you can, like, litigate it and try and figure out... You could be like, all well... All that other stuff. You know, his EPM is this, and sure. we're paying this amount of dollar per this right. amount of win. I mean, you can look at it, like, in strict economic terms, once again, yeah. if you would like to. If that's how you want to live your life, move the day to day, then <laughs> that's okay. It's not even your money, and this, this organization has lots of it. Um, to, to, but, yeah, in any case, I think from a basketball perspective, we get Kelly on the, on the team for another two years. Uh, obviously, the Raptors need to move on. They can move on. But on Kelly's side, it seems like this has always been the goal. He was hoping to come to Toronto eventually. And he actually spoke about it today uh, at the Raptors Pax facility when they announced it. So here's the clip of Kelly talking about signing this deal and, and uh, his relation to the Raptors in particular. It was an amazing, you know, welcome, you know, homecoming, um, you know, enjoying being home, um, you know, on home soil. You know, that's been really special. Um, you know, the, the staff and the organization has been top tier. It's been great. For me, it was like, you know, they traded for me. They wanted me here, um, you know, just to reciprocate that, that, that love and, you know, show that I do want to be here too. You know, I've you know, wanted to be here since I was four years old. So it's, uh, you know, special and, you know, just to, to create that, you know, that trust and that bond and, you know, hopefully you know, be here for the rest of my career. There you go. Hopefully, I'll be here for the rest of my career. Um, yeah, for Kelly. I mean, this guy literally. This guy literally said he grew up listening to Fan Five Ninety on a clock yeah. radio. Yeah, that means something that's to me. you. That's <laughs> me. That's what I'm doing here. Why do you think? Why do you think I'm here at Fan yeah. Five Ninety? I've done the same thing. Shouts to Paul Jones. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, ageless wonder. Paul you were Jones. grabbing the TV, saying he just like me for real. Yeah, yeah. but I, I'm grabbing the clock radio, like yeah. saying that. Yeah. It's um, to his connection in Canada. Obviously, is cool. I worked with his sister at Foot Locker. Oh like, wow, we, we were coworkers. Okay. Yeah, right. she played at the University of Saskatchewan. We we've played basketball together quite nice, a few nice. times actually. Maya, and um, and and his dad too. Like they've they're thoroughly entrenched in the fabric of like yes. Canada basketball. So if there was anybody, you have the intention to come back. You have the intention from the Raptors' point of view to find a way to make it work. You know. He talked about the reciprocity. He could have waited till the summer, but he wanted to like go there now mm-hmm. and reciprocate. Like you guys traded for me, there was clearly interest, and I think that just speaks to the level of the relationship. I think that's a great thing for for both parties. And honestly, I expect him to help facilitate really good basketball the proper way, Darko's style for the next few years, well, two, and the end of this one. And I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think. It's totally different in terms of scale. I mean, Pascal's contract was a lot bigger and it's more Three much bigger. Times than, bigger, yeah. Yes. But I was like, you know, we'll talk about the contract extension and then maybe we won't talk about it. And then maybe it's on the table, maybe it's on the table. It just went on for months. Like literally months. And in this instance. <laughs> um Well, Gary's also is like Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Most contract extensions are kind of like that. It's like, oh, yeah, maybe we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. Yeah. I think when this one Clearly, they, they traded for him with this idea in mind. And I think Kelly knew that. The Raptors knew that. And, yeah, even after the All-Star break, just catching up with some, like, you know, sources or whatever you want to call it. Honestly, it's not even worth, you know, using that word. But it's like they were talking about it. And they were like, yeah, no, we'll, we'll get to Kelly. Like, it's 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 going to happen. And and a week later, it actually happens. Wasn't much to negotiate. The Raptors, I think, after trading for the guy, I think there was, like, you're allowed a 5% uh, increase in bump. And so they gave him the bump or whatever. But... In any case, I think he's going to continue to be a second unit option for them. And I think for the locker room, too, it's just not to say that the Raptors need people to be like, hey, it's it's important to play for the Raptors and represent for the Raptors. But I, I don't mind having a person in there who truly understands that. He's got that deep, booming baritone as well. It might help command respect in the, you know, he's like, come in, you know, he's got that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so congrats to Kelly. Congrats to the Raptors. You guys get it done.
uh, we actually have a pretty good sense of who's going to be on the team next year. I guess a mm-hmm. lot of the rebuilding happened midseason. So we actually have a really good idea of what um, the group will look like. And hopefully they can enjoy some of that stability and actually build on it. Because, you know, uh, the last couple of years, they've had stability. They've also just had instability within that. And now everyone is here. They're together. Hopefully they develop a new identity. Um, real quickly, just uh, to address what was something we said on the show yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> the, the the inflation of Raptors assists. Um, Samson, what, what what was your claim? What was your claim? I just okay. want to get it on the table first. So I have to give credit to my friend. He referred to the Indiana Pacers as an assist farm. As in they play mm. a style of basketball that creates a lot of assists. And he was doing this basically to undercut Tyrese Halliburton's okay. stardom. I like and that. so okay. early on in the season, I was watching Dennis Schroeder. Mm-hmm. Just get an insane amount of assists. Dude, I we watched, had him on the show. We were like, you have more assists than Luca, Dennis. How how are you doing that? You know? And it, so, in yeah. my opinion, I was watching... I Early on in the season, I went and watched back. And I'd watch Dennis, like, in my opinion, not really give an assist. Mm. Now, the way I framed it yesterday, my mistake. It sounded like a mm. shot at the Raptors scorekeeper. Yeah, this is justice that, for Raptors scorekeeper. Exactly. Yeah, this, this is, is justice here. for them. This is egg on my that's, face. That's who Kelly's mom used to be. Exactly. Yeah. I wasn't careful enough in my phrasing. Yeah. What I meant to say is that what constitutes an assist in the NBA now mm. is maybe not as strict as what it used to be. I hear you. And the Raptors play a style that encourages a lot of that, like, we didn't necessarily create the advantage for the guy. Yeah. But he did get past the ball. And so... That's the assist from what I was talking about. So, um, sorry for stealing the valor of the, <laughs> the, <laughs> That's the right. scorekeeper. That's what we do on the show. We fact check. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Wait, yeah, the I, stats, though. We I did them. quickly look at the numbers, right? So, in terms of home assist versus away assist, the Raptors are actually remarkably honest. They're minus 0.4, as in they average yep. 0.4 assists more on the road than ethical. they do at home. Super ethical. And it actually completely tracks when you look at how many passes they throw in a game. On the road, on, at home, they throw out 303 passes. At home, they th- uh, on the road, they throw out 300. So it's like literally a, a difference of three a game. That's like literally nothing. So, yeah, I mean, the Raptors are actually one of the most honest. There's a couple of teams that stand out in this sense. The Denver Nuggets, 2.9 more assists at home versus on the road. Scamming. Could, uh, well, do you think, <laughs> I mean, is that scamming or is that like, you know, uh, altitude? I mean, home court advantage? What do you call that? I bet I bet they do let the ball do more work. Mm. Let the defense try and catch up to it at altitude. Yeah, that, I think that makes sense to me. There's a couple other ones. Uh, 2.2, as in 2.2 more assists at home than on the road for both the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers, which I was a little surprised by, uh, and then also the Atlanta Hawks. Mm. Yeah. I have no idea about that, but can we take this for a segue? Okay. What have you so, made? I'm sure you've talked about this a ton this season. What's going on? But... You know, you and I are busy. It's not like we're tuning into the respective no, no, podcast. No offense, but no. Your your opinion on Darko <laughs> yeah. actually completely shifting yeah. the team into like, there's a ton of passes yeah. happening here. There's a ton of assists happening here. I think, I mean, number one, when you take away some of the players who have the skill set to play more isolation, you're up, you're naturally going to change your play style. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's gradually what's happened. But I also do think that even with some of those players in tow, like when Pascal started this season, they clearly had this identity from the start. So I think it's actually pretty consistent as to what Darko pitched the idea of the team's going to look like under him. And then he's come here and he's actually executed that vision. That always, to me, earns a lot of respect in the sense that you come in with an idea as a coach and your players actually follow suit. It's not as simple as, you no. know, like, look at Adrian Griffin. And, and Well, you can't even look at him anymore because he's, he's actually out, <laughs> out of the job. But it's like you come with a bunch of ideas and the players are like, nah, screw that, man. I'm going to do something else. That's so much of coaching. That is so much of coaching, especially at this level when you have to not just coach towards the goal of winning, but you also have to coach towards the goal of each individual player being able to win and, and, and maximize their own earnings within this very short window. So I think for Darko coming in, A, it was impressive that he actually put the system in. And I do think that, like, B it creates more opportunities for other guys to grow because you're what when you're making more passes and you're making more players being involved in the actions like you have more op, 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 at least an opportunity for them to like make decisions and maybe make mistakes probably totally. make mistakes but go through that process and you saw Malachi have the ball more than he ever did you know last couple of years play more minutes as well precious had more I mean, they were essentially, they were like, Precious, have you heard of Kelly Olnick? Can you play like him? And the answer was definitively no, like no. literally no, right? And he's finding success playing essentially just, you know, iso ball, play, pick and roll. He's been awesome defense. with the Knicks. He's man. been awesome. Unbelievable. Right. But I think that, yeah, this, this system for Darko really did allow for 
at least us to see some of those things. And it's not going to work for everybody. Like, I don't think, you know, it's working for Chris Boucher, for example, who can never get into the game. But at the same time, like, it's working for other people. So, yeah. um, I'll t- yeah. I take a moment to say, since I talk about this in my own coverage, but I'm on the big program. For anybody listening, I think Darko has done, like, a phenomenal job. I know there's, like, sometimes dissent. And I think there's pushback, but yeah. I don't know. I've made my bones in coverage. It doesn't mean I'm right or wrong. It just means I pay more attention to this. In like paying attention to X's and O's and what coaches are able to implement, yeah. I think what Darko has done is pretty impressive with the Raptors. And yeah. it hasn't okay. translated into wins necessarily. But was that the pitch? You know, I don't know if that was the pitch. I mean, you can go back to listen to his intro press conference or him at media day. I don't think it was so much about the winning aspect. Yeah. The only thing I held against Darko was at the start of the season, I didn't feel like he got the most out of that particular group. No. Well, I wrote about that because, you know, I, we had like the second spectrum statistics and it mm-hmm. was like looking at how little Pascal was getting the ball. This, there's a huge change in Pascal's role in the first seven games versus everything afterwards. And the yep. Raptors had a historically bad half-court offense in the first seven games. It was like eight Process six points bad. per possession. Yeah. yeah. And... Basically, like, Pascal was doing, like, three times as many off-ball screens. Wasn't getting to do much stuff. But they figured it out. Their offense was they insane did figure, they did from, like, December until the team got broken up. Offensively, I think Darko has brought fresh ideas. Defensively, execution-wise, talent-wise, whatever you want to say, injuries, youth, whatever, it just hasn't come. They've been in flux. Yeah. Which isn't, like, a total pass. Mm-hmm. There's some, I'm sure there's some coaches who could have gotten more defensively right. out of this Raptors. Team, but I think um, Darko, I've been pleasantly surprised with the season so far. No, for sure, for yeah. sure. I mean, I think I had some criticisms with Darko to start the season, but as it's gone on, I'm like, I totally yeah, get it. Man. Well, me it's, too. It's cool. yeah, criticisms don't undo like the overall. Like every coach will have criticisms, especially it's literally part of the job. Yeah, man. yeah. Well, all right. Before we go and take our first break, I want to let you know that we're giving away some tickets. Yeah, Grammy award-winning rock bands, the National and the War on Drugs, are touring for the first time together, and they're coming to Budweiser Stage. On September 20th, with special guest Lucius as part of their Zen Diagram Tour. And we have tickets to give away. To enter, all you have to do is text the daily code word to 590-590. Today's code word is Zen Diagram. Two words, Zen, not Ven, Zen Diagram. Text Zen Diagram to 590-590 right now for your chance to win. We have a final pair of tickets to give away on tomorrow's show. But if you don't win with us, tickets are officially on sale at Ticketmaster.ca. I cannot wait to go see the National for the fourth time now. But in any case, uh, I want to take another break. I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. Welcome back to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, Wim Lou. Continue to be joined by co-host, Samson Folk. And, Samson, you've requested Dan. Dan Favell of Bleacher Report, host of Hardwood Knox Pod. What's going on, Dan? Thanks for joining us. Oh, no problem. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's uh, it's an absolute pleasure, Dan. Thank you for joining. And you're here to talk with us a lot about, like, the Raptors and Pelicans. And we're going to rely on some of your uh, expertise of the, the league at large. And the first thing I want to say is, like, the Raptors and Pelicans is a bit of a mismatch at this point. You have a, you know, a Pelicans team that can bludgeon the paint. You have a Pelicans team that can get on the offensive glass. And you have a Raptors team that is relying on... A thin front court at this point in time with Jakob just dislocating his, you know, his pinky finger and Scotty having surgery on his third metacarpal, I believe. What do you make of this matchup just off the jump? I honestly have no idea what to make of it because I look at what the Raptors have available right now and I don't know, like, what are you supposed to do against Zion Williamson at this <laughs> point? What are you supposed to do when he gets downhill? I think every team has that problem, but now you get into a point where what is going to be your primary defender against him? Are we going to see a lot of Akbaji or Bruce Brown? I just, I can't even envision it right now. I think they're probably going to get bludgeoned on the offensive glass would be my guess, but the Pelicans offense, I will say, does feel like it has this tendency to bail out of a lot of its best features sometimes. And so if you're able to kind of cut them off and stop the, not just the rim pressure, but maybe even like the second shot stuff, Uh, That feels like Toronto's best ticket to win. I just don't know if they have the size or strength right now to do that. Wait, can I can I dig a little bit in? So when you see New Orleans kind of like bailing out on some of their more successful actions, what is the what is stopping them? Is it truly them just being like, ah, we don't have the you know the commitment to it, or what is the defensive response? Uh, I hate saying that they don't have the commitment to it, but it feels like so many times I'm watching different versions of the Pelicans offense without seeing enough different personnel on the court where it's. Are you going to run things through Zion enough? 
is this a bi night and if it is a bi night is he actually trying to follow through on some of his drives when he gets the space from the defense or is he going to try and bail out and take more mid-range jumpers and that feels like a big thing with them and then how willing are they to maybe i don't want to say deviate from their core lineups but a lot of the times their offense flies a lot better if you're subbing one of zion or ingram out and throwing trey murphy in there with cj mccollum with herb jones and so how often will we see them go to that look um so i don't want to say they're not committed to it maybe they call it exploration but there does feel like a real troubling level of inconsistency to what they do that defenses aren't always responsible for mm. yeah it does feel a little bit like they don't necessarily maybe coexist as much you know they, they do sort of take turns and i think last time the raptors played them it was very much an ingram night i mean ingram was making all sorts of wild shots and it was like a 30 40 point game essentially by the end of the third quarter and the crowd was really getting into it um other nights obviously you've seen zion really cook the raptors as well jb you know against the raptors has... it was that game last year in late november we had six friends get together to watch that we thought the raptors had momentum uh -huh. and it was after pascal came back from the injury yeah and they just got absolutely demolished and it was the birth of that zion all five Raptors are playing defense and looking on as Zion was dunking the basketball. Right, right. Truly demoralizing. This team has the the potential to demoralize the Raptors. Yeah, I think one of the questions I have for later on was just um, how many mismatches are there? Because, <laughs> you know, sometimes you have a mismatch and you got a double team somewhere. But uh, if you have like four mismatches, uh, you might need a sixth player. But in any case, I think one of the topics that you wanted to get to was Grady versus mm -hmm. Jordan Hawkins drafted 13th for Grady drafted 14th for Jordan Hawkins Jordan Hawkins obviously has already had some big 30 point games but Grady's coming on strong now and now it's more of a debate so we have like the most I would say you were like probably the most optimistic Grady you know I had Grady scouts had. tell me he was gas and like he's been pretty great but yeah, I, yeah. I do like the 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 conversation about who is shooter supreme Mm. out of this draft class so far and dan i kind of want to swing it to you off the start because i know you are grady curious and i know you are very grady pelicans curious, curious. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i i just want to get your your official take on it because i'm biased over here to be quite honest yeah so i anyone who knows me knows i appreciate scalability of shooting mm. and when i watch what grady dick does on the court he feels a lot more scalable and look to say it like the sample size is so small for both these guys technically at this point what he does feels so much more translatable and he doesn't seem to especially when you're this new um try to play outside what they actually need him to do where jordan hawkins feels like he will freelance a little bit more which isn't necessarily what the pelicans need from him and i think that's a huge difference between the two and maybe it's also a function of sometimes the pelicans offense just looking at the way they play you're not going to generate hawkins as many easy shots but from what we've seen from grady lately um, I really appreciate that scalability of his shooting where there's like a, not a, I don't want to call it a simplicity to it, but he's not necessarily going to deviate from what works. And so I think right now, I don't want to say it's not even close, but just the tear that Grady Dick is on. I think this is someone you look at and even just kind of looking at him defensively, like he under, he's not great, mm -hmm. but he he's big and he knows it. Um, I think that's going to end up being a big deal long-term. And so I would expect him to pan out as the, the more impactful NBA player. And just to provide some background for people who are wondering about like the Grady versus Hawkins thing, Hawkins probably the most accomplished collegiate shooter since like Sam Hauser at Virginia. And a lot of what Hawkins did at Connecticut was like the whole offense was built around getting to his shot. Mm. And I think you can see some of that with the Pelicans. Like Hawkins, volume is really important as the three-point shooter. Hawkins has had, he's shooting a little bit worse percentage-wise, but he takes like almost 50% of his threes come above the break. Mm -hmm. He takes more tightly contested threes. He takes harder three-pointer shots than Grady right now. And Grady has quietly, with the rest of his game, I think exceeded what Hawkins has done in his rookie season. But I think his shooters right now, I think Hawkins at almost two years older is probably the more accomplished shooter. Mm -hmm. But I think, and I talked to Shemit Dua, who is, uh, you know, mm -hmm. he does great coverage on the Pelicans prior to this season. And it was like, I was like, oh, the Raptors drafted Grady. You guys drafted, you know, Jordan. Who do you think's better? And he was like, Grady's better. He's a better overall player. Mm, and so okay. Shooter Supreme is maybe leaning one way. But as far as like the player overall, I think it leans towards Grady. So, Dan, you were, you were talking about the scalability of what Grady does. Can you, okay, what is that like, you know, for 
uh, a more novice o- audience. Uh, not to say that this is necessarily a novice audience, but I'm just curious. Like, what do you what do you mean by that? And what do you see in Grady that, yeah, that gives you that sense? Watching. Yeah, my grandma's watching. Yeah, tell Samson's grandma. grandma like, what what are you talking yeah. about, man? Samson kind of just touched on it when you're talking about what was built around Jordan Hawkins in college, and you can see the elements of mm-hmm. his freelancing. Where if you plug him on to any other team, maybe they try and play him differently. But will he be as effective? And I think the way that Grady Dick is playing right now, you could put him on any NBA team. Maybe the quality of three-point looks goes down and we see the efficiency kind of suffer. But the stuff he's doing in terms of like the spatial awareness of getting to the corners, Mm -hmm. um, Jordan Hawkins doesn't seem to, he seems to want to do more. And even just like when Grady Dick does, I think it was the Warriors game, but I think was one of his just better outings. It was the fourth quarter. He's on the weak side and he's able to like pump fake out of the three drive and hit a fadeaway over Moses Moody. Stuff like that, like attacking those closeouts, but being more situational about it to where Jordan Hawkins feels like if he's in that situation, maybe he takes the three, but is he going to kind of like take a fadeaway mid-range jumper or turn around and kind of up the level of difficulty? And so I think when you're a shooter, especially as a rookie, your job is to come in and impact the game without necessarily making it seem like your team is playing a lot differently. Like you might change the spacing and the stuff that Grady does, I think, as I said, with scalability, I always frame it as, can I put him on... 25 plus other teams mm. and the same stuff is going to unfold and i think the way he's playing right now lends itself to that more than hawkins and that was based on what i heard from the pre-draft stuff for grady was like some teams do run those drills where they're looking at what do you do after a long closeout mm-hmm. and what playmaking reads are available to you and grady in those workouts mm-hmm. like always making the right read mm-hmm. like always seeing where the rotation comes from seeing like the weak side zone on the back end how do you get the guy to cheat like above the break so you can create a corner three as a passer? Using the the dribble to probe and then being able to use your motion and your gravity to mm. create something for other teammates instead of just being a shooter. That's really great context because who knows what they do in these draft workouts. But it seems like it's a problem-solving puzzle like this actually makes a ton of sense, especially for a guy like Grady, who you are drafting him in large part because of what he can do, not just making shots, but making good decisions when he is getting closed out on, when you're seeing different coverage, et cetera, et cetera. I think a lot of teams, what they did with Grady too, was they're like, that uh, that coach, that dev coach, who's like mm-hmm. a bit, little bit burlier, yeah. is like, try and get uphill over the screen over me. Like, I'm going to try and, like, okay. it's like a cornerback at the line. Yeah. Really run him through, like, the physicality. And then that was obviously what, sure. you know, we, we talked about with um, Darko was one of the first things Darko said he talked about Grady with was like, techniques to get up the floor Mm -hmm. and beat kind of like more physicality around screens at the NBA level. And that kind of stuff has been popping off more for him lately too. Yeah, for sure. I I think the question for me is just like Grady's long-term outlook. Mm -hmm. How soon can he, can can he reach the level of being a starter? How soon can he reach that level? Um, Is there something that needs to break for him? For example, if Grady were to be a starter for a start for a playoff team, for example, what are some of the skills that he continues needs to add or just continue to improve on? Yeah. Well, I, I'll swing that to you, Dan, actually. From the outside perspective, what do you think Grady is like the easy stuff he can start to achieve more often and the more lofty expectations? Um, so I'd probably like to see him maybe attack a little bit more often, especially mm-hmm. given the personnel that they have available at the moment. Um, it feels like he might have the freedom to do that. And in terms of more <laughs> complicated stuff, I wonder if we can see more of like, these aren't all zero dribble threes. And I know there's value in motion shooting or just getting out in the spatial awareness, but like, does he have the... Is it an escape dribble? I'm not asking him to take these methodical step backs against like a premier wing defender, but can he do more of that moving forward to add just sort of a another layer to his his outside game where it's not just about, well, can he score at different levels or get to those different levels? Can he do different stuff at the same level right now? Yeah, I think that is really important, like the pound dribble or escape dribble to beat a closeout instead of, because it is good to be able to be pushed downhill and make a progressive read. That's a big deal. But also like keep it above the break, keep mm-hmm. it, you know, keep it a three-point shot and make sure that that person who got you that look is kind of being rewarded on that. That kind of stuff is really, really important. And defensively, I like that you mentioned it because Hawk- to get back to the, I guess, close it up, the Hawkins versus Grady thing, mm-hmm. Hawkins has struggled like immensely defensively. And Dan, as you mentioned, Grady's bigger than a lot of like motion shooters. And he he does early work defensively. Like, I don't know what he gets into with the scout, but he has a really great feel He's a very cerebral player in kind of reading what the offense is trying to do and beating guys to spots. And, you know, Steph No had that great video where he was mm-hmm. detailing that Grady's just getting, like, smashed around the court constantly. <laughs> he gets dummied quite a bit. Yeah, yeah but terms. the willingness to get dummied is, uh, like, admirable to me. Sure. Yeah, I guess. I mean, he does take a lot of charges. One of the big plays that when, when he was, like, 
second, third week into his career with the Raptors was he took that charge on Giannis. Yeah. Now, it was he was falling over already as Giannis came. But still, like, the fact that he was willing to step in for a charge and actually had the anticipation for that was watch, quite good. Do you too, watch so. Game of Thrones, you guys? You remember, like, the King Robert when he was talking about he was fighting the Targaryen? I can't remember the prince's name. And he was like, I crushed his breastplate with my hammer. Gods, I was strong. Giannis must have felt like that after he hit Grady. Like, he's just like, <gasps> I can't imagine taking that physicality, man. Nuts. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Would you survive a, if, you were, if you were to step on the court tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, good question. Against Giannis. And you took a charge. Nothing dirty, just a regular charge. Do you think you would break a bone? Do you think how long would it take for you to go back on the basketball court after uh, taking such a play? Me, I'd be done. I'd be <laughs> the last basketball play I'd ever, I'd ever author. I think I'd break all my bones. I wouldn't be able to get up. I, would, I wouldn't be able to do it. Oh is, is there an NBA charge, player? Wait, is there an charge NBA player? Insane. Could anybody take a charge from an NBA player here? And which player? Uh, Marquise just got waved. I feel like I could have taken a Marquise charge. No, I mean just physically. You are like, bigger than him. That's yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Who's the biggest guy you could take a charge from? This is a roundtable question. Oh, my God. On the Raptors, even? Sure. Maybe McDaniels? He's slender. Yeah. But he would truck me, though, to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would also break a bone or something. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I feel like uh, maybe like maybe the bigger the guy is and he doesn't lower his shoulder a lot, maybe you could just get like a hip to the chest. And... Yeah. That's ideal, you know? Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe Kelly Olenek. I'm just kind of like I standing don't know, man. in. Kelly looks gigantic. I feel like maybe maybe RJ because he would just he wouldn't like fully plow into you. He would just like use his shoulder to like shove you off, and maybe it wouldn't be that bad. Dan, are there any Raptors you could take a charge from? Probably not, but I might try and game it to where it's well. Who doesn't want to go to the foul line on the Raptors? <laughs> like, and might hey. just try to avoid me. So you're, so you're like, taking a charge on Jakob Purtle. Yeah, try and take, a, take a charge from him. That's how I game it. Yeah. That's pretty clever. Yeah, like a guy who is like. When he gets up to the line, like you can see the sweat beads rolling down his face. Right. That's who you want. Like he's gonna try to euro out of the way. Maybe you just get clipped. Yeah. 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 That's what happened to Grady when he took the charge against Giannis. Well, this is nice. I like this because I think at the start of the season, especially when Jordan like had some early opportunities and he had some thirty pieces, it was like, I don't know, about I Grady. A lot of people And now it's swung around, it seems like at least. We get messaged all the time or like okay. tagged on Twitter. People being like, Why did they draft Grady? Like I, I saw the I, season for absolutely. I saw a especially ton of that. when other guys were getting off to great starts. Hame yeah. was off to a great Deontay start. George. Deontay was off to a great start. You know, yeah. out in Houston. Even like Pajemski, people were like, speaking yeah. of charges. Yeah. By the way, Pajemski's <laughs> taking more charges than like seven teams in the league so far this year, which is kind of nuts for a rookie. <laughs> Man, I don't know what it is about a guy. Like I don't know how you train that into a person to like. You just you take the dive. I think his dad wow. has like a military background or something like that. Mm. Yeah. He, like, very procedural in the draft process <laughs> yeah. as well, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess. But, like, to see it swing around, yeah, is super cool. Dan, who who did you like better out of the draft initially, Jordan or, or Grady? I actually did like Grady. And the person who sold me on it uh, now is working for an NBA team, but Adam Spinella uh, told me to go back right. and watch Grady Dick on defense. And so I went back and I watched. And, like, the team stuff and just re kind of realizing his size and some of the stuff that – you mentioned stuff he could do early, but some of the stuff they felt like he could even break up on recoveries or help. And I was like, oh, this is this is the guy. And so it was like when you were talking – even, like, throwing, you know, Jet Howard into the equation when they were all talking about those three players. Right. That's what ultimately swung me on Grady Dick was I thought he had the higher defensive potential of those three guys. There you go. To kind of keep it with the Pelicans just quickly, you know, this is this is a team that interests you greatly. And if there are any Raptors fans or just basketball fans who are like, who who's cool to look out for tonight? Yeah, like, give us enjoy, one quick name. You I got 15 hoops. seconds for this. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. You said 15 seconds to, yeah. who's to watch out for tonight? Yeah. Uh, I just, watch Herb Jones. Herb just watch Jones. everything that Herb Jones does. Like, he's just the key, the key to the Pelicans defense, which is can be very ferocious on certain nights. There you go. Right. Yeah, not on Herb. Not on her. Yeah, there you go. All right, Dan, I appreciate you for joining us on the program. Sorry to cut you off. Live radio is very <laughs> unforgiving. You know, they're like, we got to hear those commercials, and we're going to hear those commercials right now. Been your, uh, <laughs> we're going to take this break. I'm your host, Will. You'll be listening to The Raptor Show on the Sports Night Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. Welcome back to The Raptor Show on the Sports Night Radio Network. I'm your host, Will. Luke. You'll be joined by Samson Folk. We're just... We're really discussing just how terrifying Twitter can be as a place 
Yeah, hit the on button and tell me tell, tell this revelation you've had about the Muse accounts. Thanks for giving me the on button thing. I actually <laughs> I forgot. It's all good, so, don't worry. I saw obviously something we we referenced it, you know, last episode, but something had happened over the weekend regarding like online behavior in relation to to players, of course. Mm -hmm. But something that came out of that was realizing that like the Muse accounts on Twitter yes. are part of like a network. Yeah, I did not know that. Yeah. So they so for people who are honestly blissfully not on x slash twitter or whatever um there are certain fan pages that are created with like this like kind of generic kind of drawing of like a cartoon drawing yes. of like each individual player um and they will just like stand for that account so yeah. like you'll see um you just mentioned dj carden has a muse account yeah so you know dj carden muse you know kelly muse grady they're muse they're actually affiliated yeah. But they're all like in a gang together. There's like a it's, muse gang. It is a gang. Yeah. It's a little terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. I just because you see them talking to each other sometimes, and I'm like, what are these music accounts amusing about? But what I thought was interesting was like, I never had the urge to be like, I'm gonna talk about sports. I have to like assume a different form. Like I yes. have to be a muse. I was just like, I'm Samson talking about basketball. Right. But like being like, I am DJ Carton Muse. Mm -hmm. And sorry to DJ Carton Muse <laughs> for like not trying to put you on blast, but it's just it's unique. <laughs> Yeah, it's changed sports no. fandom. Um, Siratoi, the ringer. Do you run a music account? Are, are you? Are, were you aware yeah, that yeah. all the music accounts are linked? Because this is kind of scaring me right now. I just found out yesterday because, like you guys, I am also terminally online. But yeah, I actually, I run Samson Muse and Will Muse. <laughs> oh, I don't know great. if you guys have seen those accounts. Yeah. Yeah, there is a there is a Will Lou stand account out there, and uh, sometimes they're actually generally pretty positive towards me. I, I guess that's the whole conceit. I don't oh, that's so cool! I, didn't, I actually didn't know that. <laughs> they, yeah, they took my photo from my Instagram page, which was also not run by me for the longest time. But right, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, wait, 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 wait! I know we're here to talk about basketball, but somebody else was running your Instagram, or did you? It, it was, was it was Alex. It was Alex. <laughs> Alex was running my Instagram. Account. That's awesome. Mostly because my boss was like, "Hey, you should, you know, um, expand your social profile." And I'm like, "I don't know how to use mm -hmm. Instagram," and I kind of like missed a wave in 2010 when people were signing up for this. I was still like on Facebook, I guess, and I just missed the transition or whatever. And he was like, "Yeah, that's not a good reason, Alex. Why would you just run an account for him?" And so, yeah, not having a Instagram is, I think, a green flag. Like that's a good thing. Oh, I think so too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I still don't understand. Like he's old. <laughs> <laughs> I am a little old. Um, yeah, you know, like what are the what's the faux pas? Like, are you not supposed to post on the grid? Is that not cool anymore? I posted on the grid. Yeah. I'm not that often, but I do. You're, you're a post on the grid. Sometimes I'm more of a story poster. Yeah. Samson, I think you're more of a story poster too. Samson's I, always getting his fits off or just like, right. Get, you know, wherever, wherever he is in the world, taking, right. yeah. taking beautiful pictures. That's me. Can you talk about that bus stop. I've seen, I've seen that photo of you at that bus stop in many different items of clothing now. Everybody asked me that question. Yeah. Even rappers PR was like, who's, they thought I had a photographer. And yeah. I was like, no, it's just like a bus stop with a guardrail. Yeah. And I just set the phone up. Yeah. And there's a self timer. And I just am like, this is my outfit. Is there not a, like a bus shelter there too? Or it's just, no. it's just one of those like, it's Rex. It's a bro. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You got to talk about infrastructure. I appreciate infrastructure. the consistency of the pose too. I feel like it's always like that one leg up leaning on a, on the ledge as well. Yeah. It's got to be cozy. Hat, jacket. Yeah, you got your reps. I feel like you got your 10,000 hours. Exactly. Yeah. It's, um, I watched the documentary on a guy who's, a uh, like the world's best stone skipper and he mm -hmm. was like mastery of anything is like beautiful and he talked about how Goodness. we as humans is this man japanese uh no he's white oh okay right, <laughs> but sorry. i i, I japanese i'm thing. assuming that he has been impacted by eastern philosophy greatly uh -huh. but he talked about like the mastery of something anything is beautiful and that you know as humans the only importance comes from what we imbue into things Absolutely. and i thought that was like beautiful and awesome wow yeah. that's what i try and do with my fashion <laughs> Oh, goodness. Okay. Oh, goodness. Basketball. Basketball. Oh, brother. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I think Brick Muse actually had the same philosophy. As well. Oh, jeez. Oh. Wow. Um, all right. That's the last time we'll talk about that, man. Yeah. Ever. Um, <laughs> that full-grown adult man yeah. who does that. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> We're going to talk about uh, your recent piece, Sirit, and you gave the Raptors a grade of C- minus for the Raptors this season. It was at the two-thirds mark. Raptors got a C minus. Um, this is parent teacher interview time. Yeah. I think Samson, mm -hmm. you have more of the vibe of like a understanding parent, and I'm more like a, a tiger parent. Let's sure. be honest. 
So, uh, do you want to start with the more calm aspects before I go into a more okay, uh, yeah. a sharper one? See, I just kind of wanted to get your like the top down view on what you think of the Raptors, so we can we can properly aggregate your well written piece into now the Raptors show if if you have the large takeaways. <laughs> sure. Uh, the the grade largely. First of all, I just want to say that that came before the three zero win streak and the pizza party, and mm. in my opinion, what was the high watermark? Oh, um, it totally this was. Raptors season. Wait, does the pizza swing uh, the grade? I think a little bit. I sure. think it would have it would have swung the grade. You know, I think you know just to stick with the elementary school of it all. I think that's what you would give a kindergarten class after they had a couple of weeks of of good behavior and good basketball, right? Uh, mm. So yeah, it came before that. I think it was largely it was based on a number of factors. I think we don't have to get too much into the free agency and the heel dragging and the shit. We just talked about it so much, but that factored into the grade and then also just a. The, the team that we saw on the on the court right before the all-star break um and just right after the all-star break too if I if I recall correctly was just a bit of a mess on the floor you know like I think we were seeing some good pockets of basketball but as I wrote in the piece you know just the incredibly high crunch time turnover rate for which Scotty Barnes was largely responsible in my opinion um factored into it just like the lack of cohesiveness it felt like they were still figuring out their structure Emmanuel quickly hadn't really found his game within the context of the right felt like it felt like really like the brightest spots were RJ and, and Grady Dick finding their game uh, and, and honestly in like the in the time since I think quite a few things have changed it probably it probably starts with Scotty Barnes right yeah well I think the Scotty stuff is he the efficiency dipped the turnovers spiked when he took over from like you know he he mentioned you know i think it was right after pascal got traded being in that room where he's doing the interview and he was like i think we everybody knew even before pascal got traded like i'm the guy so the idea of it didn't change but like the you know the mm -hmm. tangible stuff on court did change but the numbers are huge and he had gotten a lot more aggressive and i think like you mentioned in the piece about how He's trying to do some things that end up being bad, but it's out of like a firm self-belief in his talent to make things happen. And I really, that's something like I keep stats on is like high risk and high reward turnovers. And Scotty's always a guy who's graded really high in that. And I think like his willingness to try and push the Raptors into like a new echelon and his echelon has been really impressive. And of course that comes with mistakes, but you also mentioned about, you know, him leaving the court and how that affected like and you know the, a bit of the perception of him being like similar to Jokic has been for so long it's like the the arms flailing after a missed pass by a teammate um you know a few weeks removed from that what do you make of like Scotty his season as a whole I think we've seen a lot of improvement from that moment just in terms of body language on the court like the point I was making with that is like when you're the leader of the team everything you do becomes a force multiplier. And I think with Scotty, he's a force multiplier in and of himself. Like he's just, he's so big and he's so expressive that whether he is happy or sad on the court, it is going to be seen. Like if we can see it, his teammates can definitely see it and they're, they're going to be looking at him. So that's something for him to grow into as well. And I think like since the Spurs thing and him going to the bench happened, we've seen a lot more self-control from him. I think like I've just noticed watching the games where you see moments where either it's if it's after a pass that he tried to make turns into a turnover and he thinks it was his teammates fault or you know just what he perceives to be a missed call where like you see him almost wanting to explode but he's really just found a way to just keep it moving you know uh, run back on defense just take the next play and I think like we can see the growth on just the, the sheer the way that he purports himself and I also wonder if like th that's tied in with a level of on court growth too, where we're seeing him just set the pace of the game a lot better. He's just he just seems a lot more refined as a facilitator. Obviously, it's all before he got hurt, just in that little stretch there. But it showed me a lot, honestly. I know it was a small sample, but it was it was meaningful growth. And it was it it feels like on court accountability. If not, we didn't get necessarily the the press conference that we would have hoped for. But I don't know that at this juncture in in scotty's growth that he's necessarily the guy that's going to get in front of the media and say like hey i i really screwed up you guys right but it, you can you can see it you can see it in what's changed on the court there was um the very next game that was when pascal returned to toronto and the raptors lost 
Uh, the final plays I was designed for Scotty to get the ball. He didn't get the ball. RJ got the ball. Tried to take a little turnaround jumper to tie the game, force overtime, missed the jumper. And I think RJ was really down about it. And I think it was actually Scotty went over to pick him up. And I think that, look, he's always been a good teammate, I think, outwardly towards his, his, his teammates. I think sometimes when you see the frustrations, it's mostly frustrations with himself. Um, but in any case, yeah, I mean, those are pretty important moments. And I think you start to see more of this team making sense around him. Um, again, that's why the injury is like, especially disheartening. I mean, look, the Raptors were not mm -hmm. really going to make this play and push or honestly, even if they did, I don't think it was like moving people that much, but realistically what we just wanted to see was to continue growth with him at the core of it. And especially post trade deadline, everything is sort of sorted. He went to all-star. He got acknowledged for the improvements. He got rewarded for those. He earned that just to continue building on those. And it's like tougher to, I don't, it's even tougher for the show to, to go on and be like, <laughs> all right, we're going to build segments around Grady. Those things about Emmanuel, RJ. But I think the most important thing has been Scotty. But we've seen that um, from him at least this year. And I, I think we're pretty happy with what we saw there. What about the rest of the team? Because the C minus for the rest of the team. I mean, the Raptors, I don't know. I feel like if I were to give them the grade, I, it might be a D for me. Like, it's just, it's been a lot fair. of disappointments. But what about the rest of the team, Sierra Uh I think, I think we're seeing a lot of good stuff from them since the grade. You know, uh, I mean, we can go down the list, right? I think quickly has really found his way. It seems like he's really taken a heart. The coaching staff suggesting like, we need you to take more shots. We need you to be more aggressive. It seems like he's finishing better than he was. He's just, you know, he, he's making himself known in the context of the offense in a way that he wasn't before. It felt like he was often, oftentimes just deferential, moving the ball back and forth, not really going north south and i think that was kind of largely a problem with the raptors offense overall there was a lot of east west and not a lot of north south outside mm -hmm. of rj barrett so i think you know just seeing the growth from him has been really great it's also really encouraging as far as the future goes too like just trying to figure out what type of player emmanuel quickly is going to be he went kind of largely in the same position that scotty barnes was you know mid-season handed the keys um and not touching the ball a lot either you know like i, th I think he wasn't really taking it upon himself. And I think he's just a guy who's so good once you put the ball in his hands, like his ability to decelerate, his ability to just kind of like be twitchy and mm. trick guys. It's just kind of, it's, he's obviously he's a great shooter. So he has utility off the ball, but he's so, he's so much more dangerous when he's on the ball. And it just seems like, you know, they can, it seems like they came away from all-star and just figured out a way to use him better. And he figured out a way to deploy himself and his own skill set. A lot better too and then i mean with brady you just you have to love what you're seeing uh pretty much ever since uh you know the the siakam trade right or you know just shoot, shooting lights out attacking closeouts really well sometimes just taking it all the way to the rim um he's a good play playmaker too he's just really smart and like samson you've talked about this a ton like the guy just he knows where to be like we saw that very very early that he just was smart like he knows when he should lift on a drive he in in the context of a defensive possession like he might not always get there but he knows what he, where he's trying to get yeah i he's always been really impressive to me even that was I, I caught a little bit of flack with my analysis because people you know if you start saying like this guy lifted at the right time and then like he missed the three mm. nobody really nobody they're like really shut cares. up nerd. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of <laughs> he to bite, <laughs> the, the grady stuff has been really exciting yeah. and and of course um as far as like the the quickly stuff i the last time i looked at it i think his post all-star touches in the game were like 78 mm -hmm. and it was closer to like maybe like 58 59 prior to the the all-star break as a raptor so they're being more intentional about incorporating him in the offense and this is something that he knows he has to work on too but as you mentioned like getting north south it can't just be rj who has led the raptors in drives per game points out of drives assists out of drives since the Akam left you need more representation from other players and presumably from the high touch players scotty was doing it now you need it quickly to do it so that you can get like a consummate level of offense for like game to game so yeah Sir, where, where do you think quickly's contract's gonna come in at because he's obviously restricted and this is a pretty big time for him oh man i don't know i i uh i was i'm assuming that they will be able to get him for a little bit cheaper than uh they thought or that he would have thought just because of the season that he had but i mean honestly there's a lot of time between march like, you know, it's March 5th, April 15th. You've got a little less than six weeks. We'll see what he looks like now that Barnes is seemingly out of the picture. Uh, I have to be honest and defer here. I'm not a cat person. I don't 
really try to figure Hell out yeah. how much a guy is going to get paid. Uh, I wish Blake was here. I feel like he would have an answer to that question. Uh, I, what do you think? Going to be straight up here. I, uh, I mean, I, I think what the, the Knicks offered him. I think twenty a year um, going forward, yeah. and he turned that down, knowing that he could make more than that. And he's right; he will make more than twenty a year. Uh, I don't know. I mean, between twenty five and thirty. I, I, like we mentioned with the Kelly extension at the top of the show, it's like Raptors have room, and it's like you can't necessarily negotiate just based on like in a vacuum. It's relative to how much room you have. Yep. Raptors have some room, so it's harder to just go to the table and be like, actually, we have a firm line here and saying no. It's like you don't. And also, like a, a team could just come out of nowhere. But it's not going to be something just, ridiculous, like thirty-five or something. Like that. No, it won't be that. But a team yeah. could come out of nowhere and be like, we're going to make the Raptors pay twenty-nine. Like he's a restricted free agent. You know, another team could throw the bag at him, and then that could kind sure. of like confuse that situation. Um, so you're kind of about the the big picture Raptor stuff. You had a, a line in here that said, "Get ready to learn lottery ease, buddy," which is obviously you know a play on the "Get ready to learn Chinese" meme from NBA Twitter. But do the Raptors have like a sensible pivot or path to avoiding the lottery going forward? Because there are competing conceptions of how quickly this team, once Scotty's healthy next season, can return to like. Maybe not even play-in status, but playoff status. What do you make of, like, the, you know, short-term future of these Raptors? I mean, I think that once you factor in the IQ extension, the new Kelly deal, maybe Gary Trent, I don't know if there's going to be a lot of room for maneuvering as far as free agency goes. Like, you could add a few pieces here, but I don't think that you can make a big move that really moves the needle. And I don't think it's time, you know, I think we just have to see what these guys are when they all get healthy next season. Are they the team that went 3-0? and Are they the team from before the All-Star break? It's kind of, I mean, in a way, we're sort of like asking the same questions of the Raptors that we've been asking the last few years. But to me, I don't think you do anything to try to get them over the hump. I think that right now, as it stands, there is enough of a balance between veterans. There's enough structure that's working in favor of the guys' skill sets that you want to see develop to see what they can do from here. Maybe they simply just are a play-in or a playoff team next year. If anything, like, I would still keep trying to build assets. I would still go out and say, I know we just extended, or they just extended Kelly, but go out and see what you can get for him down the line in the trade deadline. Go out and see oh, if dark. you can get anything for Bruce Brown. I, I know, I know, On the day not, he signs and says he wants to retire. The game is the game, wow. guys. The like, game this is, is how you're right. it works. You're right, the game is it's, the this game. This is just how it works, yeah. right? And, like, if you can down the line find a way to reproduce what he does, if, like, you know, John T. Porter keeps getting these G League reps and it turns out that maybe he's the guy, then maybe he's the guy, right? Yeah. Like, that's... That's just how it goes. But I'm not, I'm, I really just don't think that they should rush this rebuild just because there seems to be just this hunger to perpetually want to like be a play in team. I just don't, I yeah. mean, this is a team that frankly, I broke this in the, in, in the grade and I still believe it. Even though we're seeing all this positive stuff, they need more talent. I want to see more young talent on this, on this team. The best way to do that is through the draft. Yeah. Um, pivoting to other teams. So I noticed a couple honor roll teams and a couple teams. That are straight up failing. Okay. We'll start with the positives. Honor roll teams. Okay. That once I got A plus, according to Sirius OE, the Knicks. And largely speaking, I think the section on Knicks was just they're so back. The Knicks are very much the they're so back team of the year. They keep losing players. Doesn't matter. Deuce McBride can somehow just make Evan Mobley absolutely touch the earth while playing 47 minutes and 13 seconds off the bench and somehow win games. Josh Hart is a walking triple double now with 13 points every single time. And um, yeah, the Knicks, they're, 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 they're back. They've added a lot of pieces. Um, why did the Knicks get A plus for you? Oh, uh, yeah, tips is tipsy, man. I, I, they get an A plus for me just also based on expectations going into the season versus what they actually are. I don't think anybody expected the Knicks to go make this run and actually potentially turn into, you know, a semi contender to make this next step into potentially being a finals team if they get healthy. But, you know, tips, tips is tipsing. I'm a, I've actually kind of moved to the next forefront of what I need to see from the Knicks and I, I I need to see that man like just completely find a way to somehow change his philosophy because these guys are just getting hurt left and right and it's it's giving it's giving yeah. like Chicago Bulls you know it's like every, yeah. everyone's out and it's so cool it's so inspiring that like they can go out and be like super short-headed and win all these games and I love watching it but what is it actually 
specifically say about your ability to do that in the postseason when you're going to be going in and like everybody's on one leg and it all falls on Jalen Brunson and you're still not playing like Boyan Bogdanovich the minutes that you need to play him because you're probably terrified that he's not going to be as good of a defender as, you know, the, the Dante DiVincenzo's and the Josh Hart's of the world. And, you know, you're right, but there's more to this game than grit and defense. We all love grit and defense, but I need to see some health. I need to just see, I need, I need, I need to see a little bit more prudence, I guess, from, from Tibbs. I don't know if we'll get it. Like the guy is who he is. Um, this, this sort of style feels like it's just part of his essence. Uh, but it, like a healthy Knicks team could go potentially go to the finals, in my opinion, yeah. just because of how versatile they are, how many different lineups they could throw out. They love each other. They know each other. Uh, but we just, I like, there's six, there's six weeks left until the playoffs start. And they are, if anything, losing more people than they were when I wrote this grade. He has a strong villainous energy tips. He, he does the comb over with seven hairs. I was going to say he needs to come home. <laughs> <laughs> he's already home. He's, yeah. he's on the no, front porch. No, but he's like he's fighting it, man. <laughs> he's ringing the doorbell. Come home, bro. Is not looks maxing at all. He's not looks maxing. I don't think no. he cares though. Could you imagine <laughs> if he was mewing? Was, oh man, that one's crazy. Oh, cool. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yeah, I think he should shave it off. As, that's what I was, that's what come <laughs> home means, bro. Strong. That's what that's, that's what when my hair was thinning. That's what they said to me. No, the, the men of the thinning. internet. It's 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 thinned, done. Man. Yeah. It's done. I feel like that would be a good change for him. It would establish <laughs> to the players that, like, he's capable of, like, look, we can change for the better. And, yeah. you know, it was that, like, the right. hot the hot coaches thing that came out, and they're like, Steve Clifford is the hottest man on earth. And it somehow, like, remember, remember the rating that came out last year? And it was like, Wait, the more... Steve Clifford genuinely won? Yeah, and they're like, the more bald you are, the better, <laughs> the better looking you are. Maybe he the... needs to get, like, a higher rating. Did there. Samson Folk write this? Yeah, 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 it was the ghostwriter. Steve <laughs> Clifford. Yeah. Interesting. It, it was pretty funny, but um, also OKC, before we get out of here, they're pretty fun. We talked about them yesterday. What do you think about them? Um, man, I mean, they're they're just another team that's right on the cusp too, right? Like, I just, I think as soon as they sort of sort out their lineups, and I wonder if we'll see in the playoffs, like, they can just hit another level still, right? Like, we're seeing sort of... We're seeing Hayward sort of find his way so far with uh, with the Thunder, but you know, also just seeing all these lineups that they're throwing out there with Aaron Wiggins, with Isaiah Joe, with Casey Wallace, like those guys potentially as your finishers have been so promising and like numbers wise, just you know, like completely beat the brakes off the rest of the NBA and definitely are better than their starting lineup with uh, with Josh Giddy eating up space and kind of getting killed on the other end of the floor. So they've got another place that, where they, they can level up, I think. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like a series, you know? Like, okay, fine. You know, you, you're going to make the playoffs, and you're going to be one of – you're going to be at worst like a, a three seed, like at yep. minimum a three seed, um, if not actually just holding on to number one. But, yeah, I mean, move like a playoff team. Like, I really would love to see this team actually make upgrades and, you know, just bring in some size. My Lakers yeah. beating them last night. All I could think about was, was I told funny. Samson that uh, the Lakers would hurt them with their size. No, actually, OKC just played terrible. That was nothing on the Lakers. But, um, yeah, the other ones I got eight grades here. Timberwolves, Nuggets, and Celtics. I'm, st- I'm sick of praising the Celtics on the Raptor show, so we're not going to do it. Do you want to Do you want to move to the flip side? No, 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 no. We're not on the Celtics. All right? I'm like, yeah, yesterday. Oh, yeah, they, they've got the best thing they wins. did. Like, great. Was that Congrats. edit on just, social media? That was awesome. Yeah, yeah. There was what a was highlight. That? There was a highlight reel that went around. They essentially like seamlessly edited like eight or nine different buckets in a row, but with like no breaks and no like actual outs. It was like Birdman the movie. Yeah, with mm-hmm. like disguised cuts where they like go to the floor and come back up, mm-hmm. and except it was basketball. Yeah, except it was Jason Tatum scoring layups. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, all right, <laughs> the three teams that failed. <laughs> the Pistons. All right, I'm going to I'm going to use a line that you wrote in your piece. Uh quote, the Pistons are the kid who drops hundreds of dollars on textbooks before the semester and then drops the class before the first midterm. That's so good. I mean, are they not? Are they not? Are they all this money going to to Monty Williams and then <laughs> to not trade Boyan Bogdanovich mm-hmm. and Alec Burks for as long as they did? This team thought that this season was going so differently than what actually happened. Yeah. Is that is that not clear to everybody? The Jaden Ivey stuff blew my mind. That like it seemed like he's a good player 
and that there was mm-hmm. and you're you used the top five pick on this young man and he seems like there's room for growth and the coach is like honestly that one's on me i didn't really see it <laughs> how 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 does that happen it's like killian hayes it, isaiah livers yeah. you're my guys it's like what yeah i mean i think that's the one silver lining right is that monty williams cannot play killian hayes anymore like he just simply he is no longer on the roster so that opens some stuff up right and i mean Jaden ivy is good yeah yeah i think he's yeah. shown a lot since his coach decided that he deserves a look <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's just, it's just, I don't know if it's that surprising, I guess. Like, this is still an incredibly young team, and they have a ton of upside. Like, they have a lot of guys that you like. I think my biggest question, sort of, is about Cade Cunningham. Is, like, you know, he kind of, he came into the league, and he was supposed to be the guy that absolutely just, like, led your team, was supposed to be, like, a, like you know, usher in a sort of new age of heliocentrism, or at least, like, follow on what we what we saw before and I just don't know that he has the scoring prowess to be that guy um and if he's not then you need to go and get that guy and this is no disrespect on uh, on Cade Cunningham I think this is just a thing that you know number one picks sometimes get pigeonholed into where I think he's an incredible player I think he's just he's so cerebral and he's so smart um, but maybe he's better off as like a one B mm. or your number two guy. And you want to go and still find the guy that's going to be, you know, the, the foundational roster yeah. building piece. There's nothing wrong with being pre-injury Gordon Hayward. Um, the next one, the oh Nets. God. Nets go- <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? Um, the Nets, uh, also got an F another quote here. The Barclay center has the energy of a dilapidated WeWork building empty. Aside from the spare parts that remind you of the Nets once promising auspices and the cataclysmic failure, the muted color palette, and the plain hardwood suggesting a preference for versatility and functionality over a set in stone identity. Um, yeah, Sean Marks is going to be at your door after after reading that one. You barred him up. Sometimes you know. Sometimes you just got to get the shot off. <laughs> you know. That's like that's, six, that's like, like six it just, shots. It just comes down. Yeah, it was. It's like the it was, Moses Malone like shots. own putbacks like eight or nine times there. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I, got, uh, I got some pushback from that Twitter on this because <laughs> apparently, I mean, I so. I, I, by the way, I've been to Barclays. I think that they are right in the sense that it would be a better metaphor for the Nets franchise overall, not so much Barclays. And there was actually a Knicks fan who reached out to me and said that they're actually a lot more like Disneyland. Like anybody can go and get tickets to great attraction. <laughs> um, and <laughs> you, you can, you can basically just see a bunch of other, other stars get off and, you know, everybody's rooting for them. Just vibes, just vibes. Um, I would maybe say like closer to Epcot, mm. but yeah, I mean, look, just not, not a great net season. Like there's just, there's not a lot to be positive about. And I think the thing that actually made me sour on them the most Compared to, I mean, like, there's an argument that you could give them a D just because they're not, you know, one of the absolute worst teams in the league. They're not the Washington Wizards. But the thing is, they didn't do anything that inspired me. And relative to their expectations, what you'd want them, want to see from them, they've been horrible. And they had an opportunity at the trade deadline to potentially get off of Mikhail Bridges and get all the picks that they had to give up in the Harden trade back and then actually be in control of their destiny. And they decided, no, we think we can do better later. And I don't think you can. Like, there's there's just so much value in actually having your own picks, especially since now, despite your best efforts to try, we know that they're going to be pretty good picks. So, I don't know. Just... yeah, Momentum is so hard in the NBA. This is something I worry about with, like, the Raptors is... There are teams that you watch them over the years as the Raptors ascended and kept ascending and had to retool at one point or another, and then obviously the Kawhi stuff. But you see teams that it seems like they're on the precipice of it, and then it immediately goes away. Yeah. And then you have Sir Sohi writing like this, like the elephant and the snake and the the rope type thing about it. It's like, this is a horror show. Yeah. And like you're only ever so far from the horror show. I know. That's what scares me as a Raptor fan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the last one, you, the Wizards got enough, as you as you mentioned, the worst team in the league. And you you did say on Jordan Poole, I want the best for my number one boy. Is, is Jordan Poole 
you know, <laughs> is, is, is that your number one boy, just, Jordan Poole? That's, that's kind of wild. He, yeah, he's, he's my guy. He's my yeah. guy. Is this know? a succession um, thing? It is. I don't know. Uh, why am I forgetting his Is name? it the eldest boy? No. My number one boy? The eldest boy was the number one Connor. boy. Well, I guess, I guess the character No, but he El says Alan he's Ralph the eldest boy, the even eldest though he's boy. not. Yeah. Yeah. But the number yeah, one boy he's is... the eldest boy from the second marriage. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Great I mean, show. Yeah, I just... <laughs> amazing show. Incredible show. Incredible I just, show. Yeah, no, I want, I want better for Jordan Poole, you know? And mm. I think... I think he can do better for himself down the line. Maybe. Maybe. That one makes me sad, though. Just makes me sad to see how far he's fallen. And yes, I was a believer. And I still, I'm not really, like, you know, it's hard to be a believer after a season like this. It doesn't even seem like he believes in himself. But that's, I mean, this is a guy who ran on confidence for a really, really long time. That was kind of his his claim to his audacity, his, his willingness to say, hey, I'm going to run the same road to Steph Curry and, and take the same same shots as him and just you know he has been drained of all of that confidence yeah um, and it's sad and i don't you know he, he doesn't seem like a bad guy he doesn't he's not <laughs> the one who punched anybody in the face so yeah, yeah. low bar he, he he did kind of go from kendall energy to like almost roman-esque energy this year mm. you know like a little bit like a sad clown type of thing I think he went from, like, Kendall in season one trying to overtake the company to, like, Kendall in season two that was oh, just, yeah. like, yes, yeah. daddy. Yes, that, daddy. That's actually Wait. so... That makes so much sense because you always feel, like, this inherent self, self, sense of embarrassment when mm. Kendall has, like, too much power, yeah. too much autonomy over the offense, like Jordan, that you're like, okay, like, this needs to be reeled back in. Right. But when he's, like, aspiring in, like, that underdog role, mm. like, I like this guy. He's got some juice. Yeah, you root for him, and then you see him fail. It's every every season of uh, succession. Yeah, catch the hype. I mean, it's over, but <laughs> you can still see it. All right, so uh, Sirat, I appreciate you. Thank you for going through this report card, and you know, for always at least thoughtfully. Look, we can always say these things are horrible, but at least you said it in a very thoughtful way that was thought provoking too. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate you having me on. Next time we do this, I think I'm gonna force you. To talk about the Celtics, oh, uh, just to be mean. Great. What's there to talk about? They're amazing. Cool. Like, great. Yeah, just Fantastic. Just, just a historically great regular season. Whatever. Hey, I got it. I work for the Ringer. We got. Oh yeah. No. All right. Well, Sarah, we appreciate you. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. Great lighting in Sarah's room. Yeah. I was like, what? The studio lighting is not doing that for us. No. She has a window. <laughs> I know. We need a yeah. window in here. Yeah. Um, there's like 90 lights in here. There For the are people who don't know, there's a lot of lights. I feel like once in a while we should do a behind the scenes thing of like what is actually in this studio. Did yeah. Alex not like? I feel like Alex was always like videoing the inside of this thing. Well, he wasn't on the show much, so he had time to do that. Yeah. Shouts to Alex. Shouts to Alex. Yeah. Offered him tickets to go see tonight's Pelicans game. And he was like, You want me to see DJ, <laughs> Card- <laughs> DJ Card? Maybe he's, he's like, nah, I'm, I'm good. I'm going to go have dinner instead. So, yeah, not a not a real hoop head. Not a real warm, um, warm rider. Not, not, not a real warm rider. His Instagram stories, lots of good food on there. Lots of good food on there, for sure. Um, I don't know how many times he's put Hongxing on the gram, but it's, uh, it's probably equivalent to the amount of times Hongxing has kept the restaurant open for the two of us. Yeah. Um, hey, before we go, speaking of tonight's Pelicans game. Yeah. It's time now for the spicy take of the day. Brought to you by the new Chunky Spicy Soup. Are you ready to get fired up? Yeah, my spicy take is not that spicy, and it typically isn't. Honestly, I'm going to be completely fine crank about it, but I was just thinking more about it. And, you know, I think if the Raptors go into a rebuild, which clearly I think right now they're in the middle of a rebuild, they should freeze price hikes for the ticket, the season ticket holders. Now, I understand anytime this comes up, people are like, well, A, it's a business. B, it's people who can afford to go. It's a luxury. No one's going to the Raptor game, and that's causing them to not pay rent or something like that. At least I hope not. Police budget. That's happening. Uh, But in any case, talking to a day one Raptor fan who had tickets, and, you know, they're about to raise the prices again. And I understand this is the way of the world. Inflation, you know, raise the prices, whatever amount. Again, there's there's a certain economics that go into this. But I think the general principle for the good business is if they're winning, if they're on the upswing, last decade or so, every year, there's like six straight years they kept improving the win rate, going deeper into the playoffs. Absolutely. 
But when you're going into a rebuild, and even this year, I guess they, they did raise the prices, but they didn't know that they were for sure going to rebuild. I suppose, you know, things happen. You got to pivot. Everyone understands. But next, next season, when you know you have, are firmly in this direction, don't raise the prices for the season ticket holders. It's just not good business. It's not a good way to treat day one customers. That's my spicy take. Yeah, I can be a hero on this one. All right. I'm in a position where I just like they should make the tickets cheaper. Oh, <laughs> like, I have right, no I'll... overhead. Let's let's be as like pro fan as possible. Yeah, make the t- make the tickets cheaper. That'd be great. I'm just saying, like, if you're gonna rebuild, if you know you're for sure gonna rebuild, you know you're not gonna be producing that much wins next year. Like, just like you know, like let 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 it rise organically with the group. Yeah, you know, I think yeah, that's like. It would be obviously a little bit demoralizing if the team was getting worse and it was kept getting like more and more inaccessible to be able to go there. Yeah. That's how you get more and more of these crowds that are like, we're here to see Luca. We're here to see Wemby. We're here to see Steph. Not to say, and tonight we'll see lots of people here to see Zion, mm-hmm. you know? And, and there's going to be a, a degree of that for sure. Like these guys are such big stars. I'm not expecting that so many Raptor fans in the building that people aren't going to come in wearing Steph jerseys. Steph's like generationally popular. But... I don't know. You see the last couple of games, it's like, man, a lot of Celtics fans in there. A lot of Mavericks fans in there. A lot of Warriors fans in there. You know, we even noticed when Steph was making shots in that Warriors game, huge cheers across the board. And part of that is you priced out, you know? Yeah. I didn't grow up in Toronto, so I yeah. can't speak from the perspective of being like a kid in the Sprite Zone and seeing yeah, yeah. that kind of stuff disappear or anything yeah. like that. But, you know, it was palpable on television to see the difference between like what I was experiencing as, as a fan seeing how the crowd would react to things like on the up and up Mm -hmm. versus now. I think that there's like, the team is worse. There's a palpable loss in energy, but also like demographically, it seems like the the crowd has changed as well. Yeah. Um, I I once took a date to see the Sacramento Kings, Tyreek Evans. You know, rookie what was, year, Tyreek wait, Evans. What was the sell here? You did you were you like it's a Raptors game and that was cool, no, or was no. it like Tyreek Evans is in town? I was very proud. I, I I put her on basketball. Nice. And she was like, "All right, let's go to a game." I'm like, "Let's let's do it." And I got two tickets for ten dollars. <laughs> it was Damn. a very cheap day. <laughs> like it cost more after transit. Wow. Down there to the game. Now, of course, those things are kind of over, right? Obviously, yeah. But like, I'm not expecting that to come back, and realistically, it's not. But still, I mean, you know, just just don't raise prices next year. That was the date. Uh, I think Tyreek had a triple double. It was a good date. I mean, they lost. Oh yeah, yeah. That's like awesome. <laughs> good date story. Sure. I've never taken a date to like a. I went with like a long term girlfriend to the Warriors game where. Oh okay. Um, Draymond punched Bradley Beal, or Bradley Beal punched Draymond. Oh okay. This good is game. Like, wow. Yeah. But otherwise, not not that much of it. Is is a basketball game actually a good date? I mean, obviously it depends on if the two people like basketball or not. But like, generally speaking, like. When you when you're on a date and you're watching because you watch basketball with such a discerning eye, like yeah, are you like? I feel like, like I'm not yo, even you see that flex ring. I'm like, not even typically like for if I'm dating, I'm not like oh you have to like the Raptors. Yeah, yeah. If the if the girl doesn't like the Raptors, I'm like that's fine. That's actually I don't better. need to, I don't it's better. I don't yeah. need to talk about Absolutely. the Raptors after <laughs> hours. Who cares? Yeah, um, she could teach me stuff about you're like her honey. Interest. Who are the three stars tonight? I'm like yeah. no God, don't talk to yeah, me about exactly. this. Please respect my agent. <laughs> Uh, all right. Yeah. All right. We're going to take our last break. <laughs> been your host, Wolu. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. Welcome back to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, Wayne Blue. Samson Folk enters his final segment as co host of The Raptor Show. Samson, how have you enjoyed being on TV? You like TV? You like radio? It's been cool. I, I always said this because, like, I don't really know what the viewership is, but being on traditional media is always, like, a really big deal for, like, your older family members. Absolutely. Because, yeah. you know, a lot of people listen to the podcast, but my grandma is, like, you know, like a podcast. Yeah. What the, what the hell is a podcast? But right. you go on TV, yeah. even if it's just for, like, four minutes on, like, a CBC hit, they're like, yeah. look at my grandchild. This yeah. is incredible. That's awesome. Is your grandma watching right now? She might be. I didn't actually message her today. Oh. I forgot to. Wow. So I'm not sure. But... Thanks for having me on. Oh, like of course, man. Again, you guys have all done me favors. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, you, exactly, exactly. Thank you. Um, yeah. What's um? So we've done surprisingly personal questions with sure all the people have come in. I think we've covered a couple of those with you as well. I think for me, um, it's not necessarily about yourself personally, but like 
what how was your process because obviously you get really really in depth and you give the type of insight that honestly is really unique in this market maybe even across the nba market in general but especially here in toronto how did you get to that point and did you know that that was always going to be your lane i had no idea honestly um the first thing i ever wrote for rappers republic was like a stream of consciousness piece where i wasn't really sure how to format like a game piece and I was just kind of writing out like play by play what I thought was happening and using it with like literature flourish on top of that. Okay. And then I read Vivek Jacob wrote a piece mm -hmm. and I was like, this is a really great structure. And that became the baseline for how I wrote like oh, all nice. of my gamers, which has changed over time. But yeah. as far as like being like a heavy analysis guy, I had no idea really. Mm -hmm. I wasn't even sure about like getting into the industry, what I really wanted to do. I was just, right. I was honestly just lucky that people liked my work, which yeah. kind of created like that positive feedback loop to do more mm -hmm. and then obviously when you went to yahoo and mm -hmm. obviously went on to do other stuff i took this the podcast that you had at raptors republic and that encouraged me to grow as far as like doing spoken analysis and i don't really know what my process is blake always like pokes fun about this that i don't take notes during games or anything like that i just like watch and try and remember mm -hmm. and talk about it but i don't know how i how i got to this point i was i was okay at basketball mm -hmm. i've always loved basketball and it just seems like natural growth to talk about the game this yeah. way, I suppose. Do people come up to you and ask you, like, how did you get into this? All the time. Yeah. Because yeah. I don't really have a good answer for them when they were like, because my answer is similar to yours. It's like, I, I did some of it because I liked basketball. Mm -hmm. And people kind of liked it. And I did more of it. And it just kind of, like, went from there. And obviously, a couple of things broke my way. Yeah. But to a large, probably for the first, like, five, six years, like, I didn't really intentionally do it. I almost felt like I fell into it. Because people kept opening the door for me to, like, keep trying to do more of it. Well, you didn't do sports media, right? No, no, no. Okay. I have so an economics degree that is not being used. Exactly. Like, Lindsay yeah. has done, like, sports media type or journalism type yeah. stuff. Vivek yeah. has done it. S has done it. I don't know what you've done, Amit. Have you done that kind of stuff? Yeah? Okay. So you and I are sitting here with no background in that kind of stuff. <laughs> I know. People are, like... They're crumpling their diplomas and throwing them at the TV right now. Exactly. So you and you and I do this work based solely on, like, basketball. Yeah. Having not, like, much of a background in journalism. That we obviously had to learn that kind of stuff on the mm -hmm. fly. But right. I have no idea how I really found myself in this position. But I really enjoy the job. Absolutely. And I don't know if it's my life or anything like that. But it's been really cool. And it's it's a cool opportunity to, like, do this show. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a cool career thing. So thank you to Sportsnet for allowing me to, like, come and chop it up i suppose yeah for sure um last question um when you first broke onto the scene for me at least sure you were this man in mexico <laughs> yeah what were you saying in mexico and then um what brought you what brought you back here why well, not back here i guess to here you're not from here but yeah so what brought me back here like toronto was raptors public was like we might be able to like Mm -hmm. pay you so that you could live in toronto yeah or like i don't live in like down it's i'm not nice with it guys okay just, no this like, man lives in rexdale man come on um yeah. but like an opportunity to actually cover the team in person because yeah. as you mentioned like i was doing analysis based in mexico and like analysis you can do from anywhere but i wanted to be able to kind of like couch analysis and being able to talk to players mm -hmm. and like establish relationships that can help inform and improve my analysis and all that kind of stuff so what brought me here was like Raptors of Public, an opportunity to do it in person. Yeah. And I would, as same as you, I wasn't sure what this was going to be for me, but I figured I might as well give it a go mm -hmm. and just see like, how far can I walk this path? And yeah. it's here so far, I guess. Dude, no, that's awesome. I, I, you, you never really know where it's going to be going, mm -hmm. I think, more than anything else. But um, first off, we got to acknowledge Raptors of Public for creating the opportunities for people to even try to do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, like this show, I mean, it's, it's me and Blake. Like, we're both like academy products of the site yeah. and now you're next and vivek was also another graduate and it's just like it's really cool but like i know for a lot of markets they don't even have that to try to produce it and it's always been independent site it's always been something that came from a, a labor of love in the first place where people don't know the history of raptors republic okay it was republic because there's like a couple different blogs at the start of the blog era they came together mm -hmm. they formed this republic i guess for the raptors they had forums, you know, like they tried a couple different things. Like, did everything hit? Probably for certain markets, but like, you know, it wasn't like it. It wasn't what it is now. Um, but yeah, I mean, guys like Sam, Zarrar. Um, I'm know, I'm immensely thankful to them. For anybody like, who knows, like those those guys have. We talked about profit motive early on yeah. in this podcast. Those are guys who put that completely to the side absolutely. and just focused on 
in a, in an industry that is basically trying to cut everywhere and it's just like how can we pay people less Raptors Republic has the smallest possible budget and is always trying to consider like how can we pay people more because this the industry time. deserves the like the backbone to do that and also it's like if you talk about Raptors Republic the effect it's had on mm-hmm. the Toronto media market it's also made it more diverse absolutely and like yeah. that's just a blog doing that and mm-hmm. it will continue to make it more diverse and it will continue to help be a backbone and like we currently do that through a subscription service to help you know satisfy the needs of the website and all yeah. that kind of stuff but it's it's imperative to like the the Raptors coverage in my mind. Yeah. And like Zarar, uh, it's probably like 10 years ago now, Zarar gave me a USB microphone, which I think you Ooh, might yeah, still he, use. Yeah. No, no. I, I had my own mic. Yeah, my friend Leg brought it actually. Okay. Uh, in any case, he gave me a, a USB mic and it like literally changed my life. Yeah. And of course, I had to do some other things with it. It's not as simple as that. But like, I, I still, I don't know. I still think about that Yeti mic. <laughs> And I still uh, feel very thankful every time I see Zoran. I always hug him and tap him. And then I banter him about Arsenal, who are number three in the uh, EPL race this year, but uh, not too far behind Liverpool. You know after we're both six Liverpool nothing. fans. What's that? We're both Liverpool fans. Yeah, yeah. We have. We don't really have time to to explore that so much, <laughs> but maybe we could talk about it off the show. Um, and in here. And every time. Bar, every time. Speaking of ten years ago. It's a terrific moment for Chelsea. It's the longest <laughs> drop of all time, man. <laughs> Goodness. Comes from an Everton fan, no less. Anyway, time now for Between the Lines. Brought to you by Bet Rivers. Take a chance. Line tonight, Raptors are uh, nine-point dogs, and the over-under is set at 228 points, point five. Uh, injuries. Dyson Daniels out with a knee injury. Um, for the Raptors, Scotty Barnes and Jakob Pertl is out. I think this means that Bruce Brown is back in, but we'll know better when we talk to Darko in about two hours. Um, in any case, this is the question I want to ask you earlier, Samson. When you look at the starting five, how many mismatches are, are, are there in favor of the Pelicans tonight? Honestly, accounting for both sides of the floor, I think it's like five. Okay. Because <laughs> like Herb Walk is, me through all five. Walk me through all five. Go ahead. Because Herb could be guarding quickly or Barrett. And like Herb has been the best three-point shooter in the NBA over the past, like, month or month and a half. Mm. He's shooting an insane percentage and on high volume. Um, Trey Murphy is, like, if he, whenever he gets in, he's he's a mismatch. Like, nobody has, the, I think, the athleticism to hang with yeah. him. He can also, like, bang triples like crazy. Zion is a mismatch. Yeah, he might as well count for three. Yeah. JV, shout out to JV Hive. <laughs> shout out to he's JV a, Hive. He's a know? mismatch. And... Honestly, like CJ McCollum, I think is probably a mismatch given that the Raptors don't have that much like screen navigation. So, so there's five mismatches, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I it would be an incredible win if the Raptors pulled this off, but it would be a huge dumb. surprise. No, I mean, I hear you though. That's why I asked you this question because I was thinking about the board and I was like, I, I think we asked Dan earlier, and I'm like, you know, if you got one or two mismatches, you could double, you could cover, maybe mm-hmm. some, you know, <laughs> it's hard to do that when you have multiple points where you feel a little bit vulnerable. But, I mean, l- last time the Raptors played the Pelicans, Raptors lost by 38. If they don't play Jalen McDaniels, I think tonight they might lose by less than 38. But that was Between the Lines brought to you by Bet Rivers. Take a chance. Samson, appreciate you for joining us on the program. Tomorrow, we'll have a new rotating guest host. And, uh, yeah, Samson's pointed towards him right now. Amon will be joining us in the desk. But uh, that does it for us today. I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptors Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. Brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky by Soup. Time to get fired up. Make sure you find The Raptor Show where we listen to podcasts. Subscribe. Please rate and review the program. Thanks once again to producer I'm a man, our board producer, Dave Brindale, Jennifer Olnick, David Sis, Jared Manitat, helping behind the scenes. Thanks to our guest today, Dan Favale. T- shouts to Shireen Ahmed. Shouts to Sirat Sohi. And uh, yeah, we'll be back to talk basketball tomorrow.